Welcome to this service of online worship through Decatur First United Methodist Church. My name is Dalton Rushing. I'm one of the pastors here. It's a pleasure and an honor to be in worship with you. If you are new to this place, please know that you were welcomed by the God who welcomes all of us. Whether you're new or whether you've been worshiping with Decatur First for decades, I'd invite you to fill out the online connect card. You'll find it in the comments or the video description. Let us know that you are in worship today. And in particular, the church wants to know if there are ways in which we can be praying for you. You can share any prayer concerns on that card. Today we'll sing, we'll pray, we'll hear a word from scripture, a sermon, and we'll have a chance to give back to the work of God through this local congregation. Before we begin the service, though, I want to share one note. The sermon this week deals with some weighty topics, including the matters of depression and suicide. These may be topics that your kids aren't ready to hear about, and if that's the case, you might consider setting them up with another activity for a bit. However, I hope that if you have youth in your home, that they're watching along with you or that you'll make time to share with them later because these are important matters that have touched our community. So we want to take them seriously as a congregation and speak to them from a position of faith. Now, as we begin our service, I invite you to join me in the call to worship. The light of God is shining, shining around and within. The voice of God is calling, calling not just from ancient texts, but from here and now. The love of God is with us, flowing around and within us. into prayer with honesty. Honest with ourselves and with God about who we are and who we are not. The best parts of ourselves 
and the parts we would rather leave out. God would not have us leave anything behind. Let us pray. O oh God, before a word is on our tongue, you know it completely. Nothing is hidden from you. So you know that we are struggling. We are struggling with tragic loss of life. We are struggling with school and work. We are struggling to love our families well. We are struggling to find hope and to live it during these dark and difficult days. The Psalms tell us that you will not be silent. And we know in our heads that this is true. But sometimes it is hard or even seems impossible to hear you. The busyness of our lives is very loud sometimes louder than your voice of love, O oh God. But that's not all. Sometimes there are lies that tell us that you aren't speaking to us. And there are ugly, convincing lies that tell us that you don't love us and we don't matter. Lies that tell us things will never get better can never get better. And while these lies are contrary to everything we know to be true, they are astonishingly easy to believe. Bind us lovingly to the truth. The truth that your love is for everyone and for every one of us. The truth that nothing can separate us from you, the truth that it gets better. You have gifted doctors and mental health professionals with tools to help us see beyond and hear beyond the lies of depression and anxiety. Give us wisdom to use those tools effectively and a heart to make them more widely available and affordable to everyone who needs them. You have gifted your church with people of extraordinary grace and compassion. But we are often at a loss for words in the face of suffering. Remind us that we don't have to explain away grief and loss. As your hands and feet in this world and sometimes your voice, guide us to comfort rather than critique and to be present rather than perfect. We pray all of this through Jesus the Christ, the Prince of Peace, and we pray as he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. A reading from the Psalms. From the rising of the sun to where it sets, God, the Lord God speaks, calling out to all the earth. From Zion, perfect in beauty, God shines brightly. Our God is coming. He won't keep quiet. A devouring fire is before him. A storm rages all around him. God calls out to the skies above 
and to the earth in order to judge his people. Bring my faithful to me, those who made a covenant with me by sacrifice. The skies proclaim his righteousness because God himself is the judge. Salah. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Hear now these words from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 9, verses 2 through 9. Six days later, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and brought them to the top of a very high mountain where they were alone. He was transformed in front of them, and his clothes were amazingly bright, brighter than if they had been bleached white. Elijah and Moses appeared and were talking with Jesus. Peter reacted to all of this by saying to Jesus, Rabbi, it's good that we're here. Let's make three shrines, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He said this because he didn't know how to respond, for the three of them were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice spoke from the cloud. This is my son, whom I dearly love. Listen to him. Suddenly, looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them not to tell anyone what they had seen until after the human one had risen from the dead. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Friends, by way of reminder, the sermon this week deals with some tough topics, including suicide and depression. If those are triggers for you, or if you have young kids about, this might be a good time for you to pause or, or mute for a bit. As we prepare for the sermon, I invite you to pray with and for me. Let us pray. O oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. O oh God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Peter said this because he didn't know how to respond, for the three of them were terrified. What an interesting line in the middle of the story of the transfiguration. He didn't know how to respond because he was terrified. Boy, that's a line that rings true for me. I'll just speak for myself. I tend to say the dumbest things when I don't know what to say. In one of the setups to a famous joke, the comedian Mike Birbiglia says, what I should have said was nothing. 
I wonder if Peter ever said that sort of thing in recounting the story of the transfiguration. This famous story when Jesus leads three of his disciples up the mountain and he turns dazzlingly white all of a sudden. It's a mystery, really. Why it happened and what it meant, something beyond words. And yet Peter felt like he had to say something. So he ended up saying something pretty dumb, which was, hey, let's just stay here. What do you say? As if the whole point of Jesus' ministry were anything other than being among us, down the mountain among us. But Peter didn't know what to say because he was terrified. Now, I don't know why we humans feel like we must say something, but so often we do. In the face of mystery, especially in the face of tragedy, humans say the dumbest things, and they mean well, they do. I wish that I could claim immunity from this, but I'm guilty too, at times. And it can cause great harm if we speak without thinking. I mean, when you're the grieving spouse or parent or child at a funeral, it can be incredibly painful to hear God must have wanted another angel. Think about that for a minute and you'll see how it's kind of cruel. And the line, everything happens for a reason, that line's just as problematic as if the tragedy is really for the best, it must be for the best. No. We mean well, but like Peter, we say things sometimes just for the sake of saying them because we're terrified and do not know what to say. This week I have been captivated, captivated by this line. He said this because he didn't know how to respond for the three of them were terrified. And partly I'm captivated by that line because as you may know, there's been a suicide in the community which has touched many of our families. The person who died wasn't connected to Decatur First directly, but many of our youth knew her. Many of our families know her family. My heart goes out to her family and friends. Our prayers and support do to we hurt around here. Many of our friends and kids, and youth and families, well, they're just devastated, as you can imagine. And I suspect that many of them, many of you, struggle with what to say in such a situation. I heard once that it is a fitting response to the death of a child to want to roll over and play dead. He said this because he didn't know how to respond, for the three of them were terrified. Can I be honest with you for a minute? There's a lot of terror out there right now. I hear it, hear it in the voices of the parents I talk to, worried about the physical, physical safety of their kids and about the mental health of their kids during the pandemic. I hear it in the voices of parents and teachers alike, just absolute terror, and I get it. As the parent of two young kids, I'm continually concerned about how they are faring during COVID. There's just no instruction manual for parenting during a pandemic. And to our youth, I'd say the same thing as they, as you try to figure out how to navigate middle and high school, which is hard enough, but you add on the pandemic business and it's just so much. Hope is on the way, but I know it is a scary time. And in the midst of all we're dealing with, you and me, I wanna say a word about a couple of topics which are really hard but really important, topics of depression and suicide. Both of these topics have touched my life in very tender ways. They've touched most of our lives, really. And so I hope that you will oblige me in sharing with you for just a few moments about these tender topics. First, depression. 
One therapist I know shared recently that before the pandemic, one in five Americans had been diagnosed with a mental illness, 20%. If you extrapolate that out to the membership of Decatur First United Methodist Church, that is 225 of us. And while it's quite a lot, my therapist, also, my therapist friend also shared that since the onset of the pandemic, 40% of Americans report struggling with mental health or substance abuse, and 11% have considered suicide. Those numbers are just astronomical. And of course, they aren't just numbers, they're people. Our family, our friends, they're us. And so I want you to hear me say as your pastor, in as clear terms as I know how, there is nothing to be ashamed of if you deal with mental illness of any kind, be it depression or anxiety or anything else. I have had these struggles in my own life. Having them doesn't mean that there's something fundamentally wrong with me or with you. Having these struggles makes us human. And just like there's no shame in having these struggles, there's also no shame in getting help and asking for help. Maybe I haven't said this in a while, but I'll repeat it now. The relationships that I have had with therapists in my life and in my career have been absolutely life-changing for me. I couldn't do what I do without them, without knowing that there are people in my corner who I can hire to help me through rough times. Please, if you are struggling and not sure of what to do, please reach out to me or to another member of the church staff and we will be glad to refer you to a local therapist who can help build strategies, who can listen, who can refer you to medical professionals if that's what it takes. For I truly believe that medicine is one of the tools that God uses to love us. There is no shame in any of this. It is normal, especially in days like we find ourselves in now. Now, these topics are sometimes related and sometimes not, but I want to say a word as well about suicide. This is a really hard topic for me to talk about. It's hard to talk about because of the emotional weight. Of course, it may well be the most sensitive topic I can imagine. And I know there are lots of questions about it from a faith perspective. I'll get to some of those questions. And if you have more, please don't hesitate to reach out. But there is another reason that this is hard for me to talk about. In junior high, every day, I would get dropped off about a half hour before school started on my dad's way to work. I didn't like having to wake up early, but the library was open in the mornings and I liked spending time with my dad almost as much as I liked having the 30 minutes or so before school to fur furiously finish the homework that I had neglected the night before. There were several of us who'd be dropped off early and we'd gather around a table in the well of the library. Most mornings it would be Warren and Mark and Jonathan and David and Danny and me and we would sit around the table and we'd cut up and we'd poke fun at one another and we would get shushed by the librarians because we would inevitably be too loud. Most every morning around that table. And we'd hang out on weekends, some too. David was the first of us to get his driver's license, so we'd pile in his car and we'd go get into low-grade trouble. 
One summer around that time, I was sitting at breakfast reading the newspaper, which I did at age 15 because I have always been like this. And I looked at the bottom of the front page of the paper to see that Danny, one of my friends who sat around the table in the well of the library, Danny had been arrested. He was 15 and he let his demons get the best of him and he was alleged to have done something awful and by God, they put it on the front page of the newspaper, his name, his age, even his address, 15 years old, just a kid. As long as I live, I will never forget reading that article. Nor will I ever understand why they put it on the front page. Because Danny ultimately died by suicide. I'll never forget getting that call either. How can a person forget about getting that call? It's one of those things that just doesn't make sense. Even when you can look back and point to signs, it's not supposed to happen. And I wish I could tell you that was my only experience of losing loved ones to suicide, but it wasn't. Every pastor I know has stories like this. Most people I know have stories like this. And it makes you question a lot of things. I'm not a psychologist or a psychiatrist. I'm not gonna to try to get into armchair science. Again, if you want a referral to someone who is a psychologist or a psychiatrist, please let me know and I'll be glad to provide you with one. But I am a pastor and I do know theology and I do know people and just like people tend to say dumb stuff when they don't know what to say, they also throw theology around in situations like these. And it is just unbelievably dangerous. You might not think theology is dangerous. And if you're certain that God wanted you to have that parking spot or whatever, I guess that's true. But theology can be very dangerous, dangerous if we speak cavalierly or in trite messages when we do not know what to say. And I can tell you this because I have seen enormous damage done in the name of the God of love in situations like this. So as a pastor, let me tell you some things that I know to be true. And foremost among the things that I know is that nothing can separate us from the love of God. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. The Apostle Paul writing in the book of Romans says this, who will separate us from Christ's love? Will we be separated by trouble or distress or harassment or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? But in all these things, we win a sweeping victory through the one who loved us. I'm convinced, Paul says, I'm convinced that nothing can separate us from God's love in Christ Jesus, our Lord, not death or life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present or future things, not powers or height or depth or anything else that is created. Nothing, 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 he says, can separate us from the love of God. Now I have heard people say that they believe suicide to be unforgivable. I think it is one of the things that people say when they don't know what else to say. Please, everything is forgivable. The sheer enormity of God's grace, the unending depths of God's goodness dwarf everything else, suicide causes unbelievable pain for those who've been left behind. And to be clear, any idea you might have that the world would be better off without you is a lie. It is a lie. We need you. The world needs you. Each of you 
God needs you to share God's love in the world, even then. In the face of such horrible tragedy, God's grace is there for everybody. The one who's died for the family, for the rest of us. Look. I know none of this is easy. I'll admit I've never really been the kind of person to avoid hard things. The truth is I really look up to the kinds of people who can walk around focusing only on the good stuff. I'm just not wired that way. Even the way I live out my faith in God tends to focus on what God would have us do now in the real world, in the messy real world, in response to all that God has done for us. After all, the writer of the psalm this morning, the psalm that was written to glorify God and speak of God's majestic ways, the psalmist writes of God that a devouring fire is before him. A storm rages all around him. Friends, cupcakes and unicorns, this ain't. But in the midst of such sadness, in fact, at its very heart, there is this truth. God is with us. God is with us mourning when we mourn, celebrating when we celebrate forgiving us for all the ways that we mess up. I mess up a lot, and God forgives me every time. God is calling us to be better. God is calling us to love. This may well be the lesson of the transfiguration of Jesus to the extent that it has a lesson within it when we encounter something that defies language, be it a tragedy or a miracle. Perhaps we should worry less about what needs to be said, and perhaps we should worry more about obeying the voice from the clouds. This is my son whom I dearly love. Listen to him. Listen to the message of love. Let me end this way. There's this ancient story sometimes gets attributed to the psychologist William James. It's about the nature of the universe. The story goes that James was giving a lecture on cosmology on the, uh, the solar system. And after the lecture, an older woman came up to him and said, your theory that the sun is the center of the solar system and the earth is a ball which rotates around it has a very convincing ring to it, Mr. James, but it's wrong. I've got a better theory, she said. And he said, what is that, madam? She said that we live on a crust of earth which is on the back of a giant turtle. Obviously, he found this to be incredible, but being polite, he asked her, if your theory is correct, madam, what does the turtle stand on? Here was her response. You are a very clever man, Mr. James. And that's a very good question, but I have an answer to it. And it's this. The first turtle stands on the back of the second turtle, who stands directly under him. And so finally he asked, but who or what does the second turtle stand on? And she looked at him and she smiled and she said, it's turtles all the way down. Now this is Dalton talking. As a modern person and as a Christian, I don't believe that it is actually turtles all the way down, though I have nothing against turtles. But as a Christian, as a devoted follower of Jesus, as someone has, who has given my life to the teachings of Jesus and his promise of eternal life, I have come to believe that while it might not be turtles all the way down, it is certainly love all the way down. 
love stacked on love stacked on love stacked on love stacked on love all the way to the heart of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Please join me in our prayer of confession. Shine upon us with your grace that we might see what frightens us and face what threatens us. Flow through us with your mercy that we might sense your presence even when we have run away and that we may know your love even when we feel most unlovable. Abide in us with your love for your love claims us and makes us whole. Amen. Now receive these words of assurance. Even in the darkest of times, the light of God is shining. The light of Christ's love and mercy are shining now, brightening our lives with mercy and grace. Amen. And now I invite you to share signs of light and love for in these signs, we experience the peace of Christ, the mysterious peace that passes all understanding. If you are watching live, comment or make a plan right now to connect with someone this week. The peace of Christ be with you. You have been faithful in giving your prayers, presence, gifts, service, and witness for Jesus Christ, even during these strange times. That has meant a little more light in the darkness, a little more peace in the chaos, and a little more love to go around. Thank you. If you would like to support the work of Christ through Decatur First with a financial gift, there are three ways to give. You may mail a check to the church and place it in the drop box by the church offices on North Candler Street. You can go to our website, decaturfirst.org, and set up a one-time or recurring payment. Or you may text Decatur and the amount you would like to give to 73256. And now let us join together in our offertory prayer. Bless these gifts with your voice of creation, your healing and your love, mighty God. Transform our meager offerings into abundant gifts for a world in need of your light and life. Amen.
Dear friends, as we reach the end of the service, let me just reiterate to you what an honor it is for me to serve as one of your pastors. And to make sure you know that my door is open if you'd like to talk about anything we've discussed today. And especially if you'd like a referral to someone who can help you navigate life. Please don't hesitate to reach out. That's why I am here. In the meantime, dear friends, go with this blessing. Go out into the world to love extravagantly, give generously, serve faithfully, live simply, speak truthfully, pray daily, and leave everything else to God. God is with us now and will be with us forever because it is love all the way down. Thanks be to God. Amen.